So the title of the Bible lesson this morning is The Power of Humility, or The Strength of Humility. Sometimes people think that being humble is a sign of weakness, but actually it's a sign of great strength, especially before God. I'm mindful of a quote by Thomas Merton. He said, pride makes us artificial, but humility makes us real. And the reason pride makes us artificial is because in reality, we're all weak, we're all frail, we're all vulnerable, we all have our limitations. And when we're proud and sort of deny the reality of our being, being weak, frail, and so on, well, that's why we're quite artificial. And humility makes us real. All right, so we'll go to 2 Kings. Uh, we'll be in chapters 22 and 23. And here we have the story of King Josiah. King Josiah was one of the good kings over the kingdom of Judah in the south. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But his two predecessors, well, they weren't very good. Both his uh, father Ammon and his grandfather Manasseh did great evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, Manasseh reigned for 55 years, Ammon reigned for two years, and was actually assassinated by some of his servants. And so Manasseh, I think, is recorded as being one of the worst kings over the kingdom of Judah. In fact, he did more evil than any other king. In fact, if you just want to look at this background, just go back to chapter 21 for a moment. Chapter 21. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because I want you to see the, the situation that Josiah inherited. It's not like the two kings before Josiah were wonderful, godly kings that kept the word of the Lord and did what was right in the sight of the Lord. No. Josiah inherited, you might say, inherited a spiritual mess because of these two predecessors. So back in 2 Kings 21, uh, just notice verse 2 for a moment. And he, that's King Manasseh, keep in mind, he reigned for 55 years. He was the grandfather of Josiah. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And if you will notice verse 6, he also, that's Manasseh, made his son to pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And Ammon did likewise. So this is the situation, you might say, that Josiah is inheriting. Uh, not a very good... Uh, you might say, family uh, background from which to come from to be king over God's people and to do what is good and right. But nevertheless, amazingly, Josiah set his heart to do what is right. Uh, you notice uh, chapter 22, I'll eventually get into this in a moment, I've stolen the background information here, but notice chapter 22, we read in chapter 22, verse 1, and Josiah was eight years old when he, began to, when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah and Bozak. And he did what was, notice verse 2, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And that's amazing. Consider what his father Ammon did and what his grandfather Manasseh did. We find that in the eighth year of his reign, King Josiah began to seek the God of his father David. And maybe he read a lot about David. He learned a lot about David's heart and David's love for the Lord. Perhaps he read some of the Psalms. And in reading all about David, he too wanted to have that close relationship with God. He too, like David, wanted to love God and serve God. So in his eighth year, he began to seek the God of his father, David. And then in the twelfth year of his reign, he started to purge the land from idolatry. He started to get rid of the idols, uh, all the high places that were built to worship false gods. So he made a great effort to purge the land 
of false worship. And then in the 18th year of his reign, the 18th year of his reign, he decided that we need to fix the temple. It needs repairs. And so he ordered that the temple be repaired and fixed up and improvements made. And so in the process of ordering people to go in, clean the temple, fix it, repair it, whether there were carpenters and masons at work doing all kinds of things, I'm not sure, but a lot of work was being done. In fact, I think the text mentions that actually there were carpenters, there were builders, there were masons. Uh, they had to cut timbers and hew out stones. So they were doing all this work to repair the house. And in the process of doing this, they found the book of the law. They found God's word or as it says elsewhere here, the Book of the Covenant. And I believe that was the Book of Deuteronomy. So that's where we pick up our story today. Uh, Josiah's in his 18th year of his reign. He ordered the temple to be repaired, and in the process of doing all of this, someone finds a very important book, most likely a scroll. And I believe it was the scroll of Deuteronomy. So that's where we begin. Number one, the Book of the Law is found. And so as we read this story about King Josiah, I want you to notice how he responds to finding the word of God. I wonder, was the word of God missing? Did they not have it? It makes me wonder what was going on. But nevertheless, they found this, this book of the law, probably the book of Deuteronomy. And let's notice what happens now. If you will, go to chapter 22, and uh, I wrote down verse 9, but let's go to verse 8, if you will. Go to chapter 22, verse 8, if you will. So 22 and verse 8 says, Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work to oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now what happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes? And as you know, the custom was back then, when you're overwhelmed with grief or great sorrow or have anguish, or are greatly troubled or perplexed or greatly worried about some impending doom or danger, they were very expressive about their emotions. They would often just rip their clothes, probably expressive of the fact that their heart was ripped or torn. And we might well ask, why? Why would King Josiah tear his clothes and be greatly distressed when the book of Deuteronomy was read to him? Well, keep in mind, the book of Deuteronomy was to prepare the people to enter the promised land. And in Deuteronomy, uh, God tells his people over and over and over again, you shall keep my commandments. You shall fear me. You shall love me. You shall obey me. Then it shall be well with you when you go into the land. I'll bless you. I'll watch over you. I'll protect you. Uh, things will really go good for you if you keep my commandments. And then when we get to the end of Deuteronomy, we have all these blessings and curses. There's a big long list of all these blessings that God will pour out on his people. If they don't forsake him, and if they don't worship other gods, and they serve him exclusively and set their hearts to do his will. They'll be blessed above all the people on the earth. They'll have plenty to eat. They don't have to worry about enemies invading the land. God will just multiply their, their livestock. God will multiply their crops out in the field. And they'll really enjoy the blessing of God. On the other hand, Deuteronomy makes clear that if they forsake the Lord, they disobey God, and they start to worship other gods, false gods, then God will bring all the curses and the judgments on them that he has pronounced in his word. So Josiah just heard all this, and he's startled because he knows that the, the people have and greatly rebelled against the Lord. He's already been purging a lot of the idolatry and false worship places in the land. And he knows how far away God's people are from God. And he knows all the sins they have committed. So now he's greatly worried about the wrath and the judgment of God coming on his people. So I say in letter B, he wants to know what will happen. 
What's going to happen? He just read about God's judgment coming on disobedience and sin and idolatry. So he goes and consults the prophetess. He goes and consults uh, a woman prophet. And uh, uh, the prophet, uh, this prophetess, this woman prophet says in so many words, God's judgment is going to come. I'm going to destroy this land and this place. But there's a special word for Josiah. If you notice verses uh, 15 to 17, we'll notice this first, verses 15 to 17. So this is the word of the prophetess that uh, she is giving that uh, the message is going to take back to Josiah, to tell Josiah what's going to happen. So verse 15, then she, the prophetess, said to them, that's Josiah's messengers, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, that would be King Josiah, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be aroused against this place and, shall be, and it shall not be quenched. So what the prophetess is basically saying to these messengers, God keeps his word. God will keep the promises he made in the book of Deuteronomy. God is faithful. You can stake your life on what he has to say. But there's a special word for Josiah. He will be spared and he will not see all this calamity that's going to come on the people. So let us see. Josiah is humble. And that's what we want to emphasize in this lesson, the humility of Josiah before the word of the Lord. So now notice verse 18, if you will. Let's go back and read verse 18. So here's a special word for King Josiah. Verse 18. But to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and you wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the calamity that I will bring on this place, so they brought word to the king. Evidently, God was quite pleased and quite happy with Josiah's response, that he tore his clothes, he was grief-stricken, he, he cried, he wept at the severity of the situation, at the gravity of the situation for his people. He was contrite before the word of the Lord. And as we shall see as the story goes on, Josiah is now trying to make sure he's going to do the word of the Lord. He's going to rectify all the mistakes of previous generations. He's, he's even going to further purge the land from idolatry. He's going to uh, celebrate the Passover. So he's going to do as much as he can to do the commandments spelled out in the book of Deuteronomy. But I just want to focus for a minute before we move on and let us see Josiah is humble. Well, what does it mean to be humble? We'll look at a few cross-references in a minute. To be humble means to be free from pride and arrogance. Or we could say it this way, it's to have a spirit of lowliness, a spirit of contrition, a spirit of submission, a spirit of subordination before God. A proud spirit would be a spirit that defies God and rejects God and says, God, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to do what you have to say. I don't care about you. On the other hand, a humble spirit is a spirit that respects God. It says, God, you're God. You made me. You have authority over me. You have the right to tell me what to do and how to live. And so, God, I, I want to put myself under your authority. I want to put yourself under your care, under your love, under your mercy, under your grace. That's where I want to be. And I want to please you because you're my God. You're my maker. You're my Savior. That's how humility works. And I also think humility is an attitude that recognizes our weaknesses, our faults, our failures, our limitations, our vulnerabilities, and says to God, God, I need you. I can't live without you. I need your salvation. 
I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy. I need your grace. I need your protection. I need your help. So I think that's how humility works. And I have some cross-references I'm going to look at. Let me just slide my little pad down here. Let's look, look, look at some cross-references. And if you want to look at these two, you can feel free to just keep your finger back in 2 Kings 22 because we're coming back. But let's, let's see how humility is, is, is described. And I'll read. If you want to follow along, you can, but I'll, I can just read them. Notice in Isaiah 66, verses 1 to 2. This is what Isaiah the prophet says as he speaks the word of the Lord. Isaiah 66, uh, and verses 1 and 2. So thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne. And earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made. And all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one I will look. Of him who is poor. Of a contrite spirit. And who trembles at my word. You know, that's exactly what King Josiah did. He was of a contrite spirit. And he trembled at the word of the Lord. He respected God and he respected God's word. Then he realized the situation was very bad. He had better go consult the prophetess to find out what's going to happen. And what I believe God is saying in there, you can't, you can't build a temple big enough to contain God. God is so big and so God is so great. So don't be all concerned about the temple. Rather be concerned about your heart. And being humble before God and wanting to have a contrite spirit. Because that's what God delights in. A humble and a contrite spirit. All right, then I have Proverbs 3 listed. Perhaps you uh, remember this passage, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Remember that passage? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God. And God will direct your path. So God will make your path smooth. Well, I think that's a good description of what a humble person does. A humble person trusts in the Lord with all their heart. And they don't rely on their own understanding, their own way of thinking and doing things. They look to God to find out what to do and how to do things. And then we read later in Proverbs, same Proverbs 3, also in verse 34, Proverbs 3:34. The writer says, surely he, that's God, God scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The text goes on to say, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. That little phrase, God scorns the scornful and gives his grace to the humble, that's repeated in certain ways in the New Testament two times. God Resist, he scorns, he mocks those who are scornful of him. But he pours out his grace, he pours out his goodness to those who are humble before him. That's actually repeated in James, I think I have James 4.10 listed. In James 4.10, James 4.10 we read, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And then in 1 Peter 5, remember the section we read for our scripture reading, 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, Peter there says, Younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you be clothed with humility. Why? Why should we all be clothed with humility? God resists the proud, but he pours out his grace, his help on those who are humble. And the whole Bible is a story of God resisting proud people but pouring out his grace on the humble. And there we learn, therefore, as a result, we should humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due time as we all show our humility by casting all of our care on him. All of our cares, all of our worries, all of our anxieties, all of our perplexities, we just put them in the hands of God, knowing that he loves us and cares for us. It takes humility to do that. We all know it takes humility to ask for help. And it takes humility to humble ourselves under the powerful and wonderful hand of God and ask for his help because we know we need God. And one final reference I have listed about uh, being humble is that passage in Philippians. Remember uh, where the Apostle Paul says in Philippians uh, chapter 2 there, verse 5, let this mind be in you, let this way of thinking in you, be, let, this, let this attitude and outlook be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
who being in the very form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a man. And when he was found in fashion as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death on the cross. Yes, our Savior was humble, and praise God he was humble. He came into this world to do the will of his Father in heaven, and he was so humble he was willing to obey God, even to the point of going to the cross to pay for my sins and to pay for your sins. Well, all right, back to 2 Kings 22. That was just a little uh, looking at some cross-references there. So let's go back to 2 Kings 22. Let me just find my place again. I did not keep my finger in 2 Kings 22. All right, let me just go back and find it. All right, so Josiah was very humble before the word of the Lord. So let's just go on and see now what does Josiah do to show that humility. He's heard the word, he's humble, he wants the word to be done in his own life and in the lives of his people. So notice uh, chapter 23 now, chapter 23, and verses 2 and 3. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah, and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which he had found in the house of the Lord. So let's just stop right there. So the book of the law was found. It was read in the presence of the king. He was greatly troubled. He went and consulted the prophetess. He found out what's going to happen. God was pleased with the humility. So what does he do? He feels it's very important that this word, the word of the Lord, be read to all the people. He doesn't just hide it uh, and say, okay, I'll well, just tuck it away and tell the people what to do, or I'll just kind of summarize things for the people. He wants them all to hear verbatim the word being read, and I would surmise this was probably the book of Deuteronomy that was being read to all the people. So uh, Josiah shows the importance of the word. He respects the word, and it's so important for the covenant people that he wants it read to all the people. Then notice verse 3. This is still chapter 23, verse 3. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took their stand for the covenant. So it's a wonderful day of, of, of renewing their dedication to God and renewing their dedication to what God's word says. They all want to perform the word of the Lord. They all want to keep God's Commandments. They all want to show their love for the Lord by obeying him. And they want to do this with all their heart and with all their soul. And, of course, that's exactly what the book of Deuteronomy uh, commanded the people to do, to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. So here in number two, the people, uh, along with the king, they all dedicate themselves to God and doing his will. Again, this is all just an expression of their humility before God and the willingness to put themselves under God. So we go to number three. So the land is further purged of idolatry. Uh, there's still idols and uh, objects of false worship that have not been removed. So if you will, notice chapter 23 now, chapter 23 and verse 4. Chapter 23 and verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kindred and carried their ashes to Bethel. Imagine, they had objects of false worship and idols in the temple in Jerusalem. How could they? Notice verse 5. Then he uh, removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem. And those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to all the host of heaven. So it sounds like they're really making a concerted effort to get rid of all false worship. A couple more verses here. Notice verse 12, if you will. Verse 12. The altars that were on the roof the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, 
the king broke down and he pulverized there and threw their dust and the brook kindred. It wasn't enough to just tear them down, but the king was so angry, the king was so incensed that these idols were built to false gods that he actually had them all pulverized, ground into powder, and thrown over the brook kindred. And then go down to verse 15, verse 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high places uh, which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, uh, that he had made both the, that altar and the high place, he broke down and he burned the high place and he crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. There again, he's pulverizing things. He's crushing things to powder. He's so outraged at all this idolatry. And he's even going so far north as into the area of Samaria, uh, going as far as he can to tear down altars. One more verse here, verse 19. Then Josiah also took away all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger. He did to them according to all the deeds that he had done at Bethel. So oh, Josiah is really doing a good job at purging the land from idolatry. And then number three, number four rather, that's number three. Number four, the Passover is kept. So that's one more thing they want to do, to obey the word of the Lord. So notice that the Passover is kept. Uh, let's look at verse 21. Verse 21. Then the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. Surely such a Passover had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. So in verse 23, but in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. It sounds like they had been neglecting the Passover and not been celebrating it very well. We might ask, what is the significance of celebrating the Passover once again? Well, as the people celebrated the Passover, they would remember and they would celebrate the fact that God is their Savior. God is the one who brought them out of Egypt. God is the one who heard their cries and, and was merciful and showed himself strong on their behalf. He brought them out and freed them from the house of bondage, and he freed them from being slaves. And then we can say, too, that uh, celebrating the Passover, uh, they're remembering the sufficiency of God. As they remember the Passover, they're not only remembering what God did for them that was so amazing that they couldn't do for themselves, but they're remembering God is adequate. God is all I need. He was the great God who delivered me from uh, the land of Egypt and from bondage. He is the one who brought us out into the wilderness. He's the one that made us a great nation. So in celebrating the Passover, they're forced to think about God, to think about their roots, to think about what God has done for them, to remember that they are God's covenant people, they are God's chosen people, and God loves them and God cares about them. So this is a wonderful opportunity to remember God and to also further rededicate their lives to doing God's will, God's way. And then finally, number five, let's just see the, the final results of humility in Josiah's life. Uh, point number five, we'll just read the last couple of verses here of chapter 23. And notice how Josiah is commended for what he has done in doing God's will. So notice now chapter 23, verse 24. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, uh, the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. So let's just stop right there. So notice now, when Josiah heard the word of the Lord, he, he no doubt probably read the book of Deuteronomy, and then notice how he responded. He set his heart to do all that was written therein because he loved God. He wanted to please God. He humbled himself under the authority of God. So notice now the strength of humility. Notice the power of humility. If he was proud and arrogant and defiant like some of the kings of Judah were, he might have ordered that book be cut up and thrown in the fire. Some of the kings actually did that. They cut up the word of God and threw it in the fire. But no, Josiah was humbled, and he set his heart to do the word of the Lord. 
So now notice verse 25. Notice what is said about King Josiah to his credit. Verse 25, now before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Nor after him did any arise like him. Wow. Humility is powerful. When we're humble before God and God really has us, when, when I'm humble before God and God really has my life, wow, good things, great things can happen. Things that are good for us and things that honor and glorify the Lord. So let's remember as we close that, well, humility is not a weakness. People out in the world might say, well, if you're humble, you know, you're kind of quiet and you're kind of passive, you don't assert yourself too much. They look at us and maybe say we're weak. But the Bible says humility is a great strength and it's a great virtue. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the lessons we learned from the life of King Josiah. We thank you for his testimony. We thank you for his love for you. How he humbled himself before you when he set his heart to do all that was written in the book of the law. May we too have that kind of humility and we realize that humility is a great strength. So, Lord, we do thank you for, for uh, putting within our lives that spirit of humility, Lord, where we, we bow at the foot of the cross and embrace Jesus, our Savior. Keep working in us. And may we always stay underneath your authority and your power and your love and your word. Uh, may your, the fruit of you, all your Holy Spirit, Lord, keep, keep multiplying in all of us all the time. We ask this all in the wonderful name of Jesus, that great example of humility for us. Amen. Amen.